Okay, uh, I'm Dave Stewart. Um, I do work at Intel, although this talk is not about Intel per se, it's about the Yakko project. So, happens to work with Intel, ARM, MIPS, and PowerPC. But, um, so I'm gonna sort of generalize. There, there is a little Intel bit that I'm gonna throw in just because, hey, they write me a paycheck, so I figure it's a good idea. It's really good to see everybody here. And a lot of what I'm gonna try and do today is uh, update a little bit some of the stuff that I talked about at the Embedded Linux conference in the spring. Did anyone hear my talk then? Awesome. Uh, oh, a couple. All right. So, um, but you know, we have done a little bit of work, but I, so I'll, I'll try and do what I can to, to help, you know, explain a little bit. There was this nice castle on the top of the hill yesterday. So that's what that is. Uh, it was a gorgeous day yesterday. So I'm, I'm hopeful that all this works since I actually didn't create this presentation until yesterday, right before the party. Anyway, what we're going to try to um, talk about uh, is, is kind of the big motivating problem, I think, that has, has really captured my, my imagination and attention ever since I started you know, really working um, with embedded with uh, this whole idea of intelligent systems, the systems that really have you know, in, in, internet connected embedded systems. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the problem is, um, talk a little bit what we've done in the Octo project to try and help. Um, Oh, this got reformed really oddly. Um, there are a few things that we didn't do that I said we were going to, so I don't want to dwell on those things, but actually a couple of things are sort of important there. And then uh, touch on a few best practices and then talk about what we're working on in the future with the Octo Project. So um, let's see if we can make everything work. So we're going to talk about sort of what the problem is. And the sort of initial, by the way, photos in here are, I, I kind of like to take photos as I'm traveling. So some of them, some are kind of relevant to the point, others not at all. So it'll give you at least something to, to look at while I talk. Um, so November 2nd, uh, 1988, is a very important day for me because uh, uh, in the, around 86, I started working for this company called Sequent Computer Systems, which is a server manufacturer, uh, defunct now. And, uh, you know, working on Unix-based multiprocessors. And uh, we were just starting to get into interested in what we should do relative to security because um, we had this, uh, uh, you know, the internet was just starting at those days. And so the, the top software guy we had was a guy who, um, he said, well, you know, this whole thing about viruses is, is kind of interesting. I wonder how hard it would be to actually create one. So with the, the understanding of his manager, there's a couple seats up here, guys, if you want to come on, come on up, you're not shy. Feel free, I won't bite too badly. Um, and uh, so with the permission of his manager, he created this little thing, then he snuck it into uh, the A.out header of an executable. And it, what it would do is it, it um, basically hijacked the entry point of whatever the binary was, and then would go and uh, write a little file in slash temp saying, oh, I've, you know, I've, I've infected another one, right, with the UID and, uh, of, of the process, and then it would go and run through dollar path, and everything, every executable it could find in dollar path of the process, it would go and stick this little thing in the a dot out header, anything that was writable. Okay, so nothing, you know, magic. And he sort of infected himself as a as a regular user, not a super user, right? Yeah. So he's, you know, for a few days he's watching the progress, and you know, remember this is one computer that everyone's sharing, right? This is like a multiprocessor that our whole, you know, engineering organization was on. So, um, but then what happened at some point is that somebody in uh, sort of the supporter, the IT group, executed, um, yeah, an infected binary, and then basically he was running his root. Sure enough, he had, you know, SUID privileges. So, so essentially he, he infected everything in the dollar path for every user, right? You can imagine what's going on now because the entire computer was like, load average went like this, everybody's ability to do anything went like that because there were all these processes banging on slash temp trying to write that file, you know, because it was trying to reinfect everything. And so a famous, you know, I always remember that, my crazy Australian manager walking into this guy's office saying, disinfect, disinfect. But the amazing thing after that was, the reason I remember Snowbird for a second was because that exact same day, the entire internet went out. Now the internet was not very big in 1988, but it was enough so we were like, holy crap, Bex virus got out to infected the rest of the internet. What's going on? So it wasn't, it was actually uh, kind of famous. This guy named Morris had what was famously called the Morris worm. He was actually supposedly trying to figure out how big the internet was. And essentially he was, you know, had a, a worm that crawled out and, and essentially shut down the internet because a similar kind of little mistake that sometimes sneaks in with programming. Now, the interesting thing is that whole system that 
I talked about that was infected was essentially a VAC 780, which, uh, if you remember your history, is about the compute power of, of probably, well, I think probably my smartphone has more compute power than that, right? And so reality is we, we crossed a barrier last year where 32-bit uh, microprocessors actually crossed the 50 cent price barrier, okay? So the whole idea of, of TCP IP connected 32-bit uh, processors is now uh, a, a reality and the capabilities that companies like Intel, for example, are, are putting out there uh, really up the ante for us as programmers. But guess what? I think a lot of us as programmers are kind of still living in the era where, oh, you know, we don't really have to think about these sorts of uh, vulnerabilities that we're introducing now in vast numbers all over the, uh, all over the, inter the Internet of Things. So um, this is actually kind of, uh, I love this was a, like an uh, uh, ancient church in Turkey. He's got a shell, though, I thought was kind of cool. So shell programming, anyway, was pretty ancient. So let's talk about a couple of examples. I mean, imagination is a wonderful thing. But let's talk about some real examples that, that I uh, uh, brought out. I mean, Stuxnet, uh, is, it was a fairly well-known uh, Warm. But in fact, it's known today, it was, it's, it's now known that Israeli and American intelligence agents, agents wrote Stuxnet to basically infect the um, uh, centrifuges that uh, Iran was using for uh, uranium uh, refinement, right? So they, it, was, it, it was basically some Siemens equipment. They went and infected the uh, Windows.dat file or something like that. Anyway, they... You know, all these centrifuges were, uh, were connected in a network behind a firewall. So it was actually an air gap firewall. There was no physical connection with the internet and, and these centrifuges. So how in the world did it get out to the rest of the internet? Well, in fact, these unrealized un, uh, uh, side effects and consequences can happen. Even something that's not designed to get out, of course, got out and cost you know, billion, you know, millions or billions of dollars of impact because of that sort of thing. So yeah, intelligence organizations are at work doing some of these things. That's one particular one that we know about. Um, so yeah, I think of industrial automation as, oh, this is, such a, this is such a simple thing. It's not at all sexy. It's not you know, flashy. You know, it, just, it just does its thing. But it's a perfect example of where these Siemens put out this industrial automation uh, based on Windows, I might add, that uh, you know had a vulnerability there that that intelligence agents could take advantage of. Um, uh, Codasys is another interesting example. This is actually uh, industrial automation software for power plants, uh, uh, nautical ships, military applications. Uh, it was revealed uh, last year that they have a uh, uh, interesting vulnerability. That uh, see if I can state this correctly. I got a I got a note that I want to make sure I oh good. Enter a password. Don, I hate security. I hate security so much. <laughs> oh, yeah, now can, now can I get the right password? Oh, first try. Amazing. Um, it was purchased, it's been purchased by 261 manufacturers, Codasys, and it basically will grant a command shell to anyone who knows the proper command se sequence. So it, 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 it basically provides a shell, and then basically if there's any um, ability that once you get to the shell to actually get to root, which is, of course, you know, um, dependent on the system it's running on. Um, and so the, the, man, the, the, the author of the code, Codasys, had basically said, well, we, we're not really capable of making the software secure, so don't connect it to the Internet, right? Because then you, it, it's relatively easy to, you know, right, you know, to, to get a command prompt. Um, somebody ran a, a quick little uh, test and found 117 sites that had the software on it that they could access through the internet. Now, maybe those are all just demos, right? Not actual power plants or military uh, installations or naval vessels that you can get a command prompt to and then become root. Right, so this, this stuff's very, uh, right, you know, very prosaic industrial automation. There's a certain amount of uh, uh, you know, risk that's involved with that as well. Is Richard here? Uh, I was hoping Richard Purdy would be here because it's actually, I told him I was going to stick a photo of Newcastle in there, so I did. Anyway, um, so uh, let's take one more example. People talk about, you know, we want to have a smarter planet, you know, let's have smart power. Um, a couple of years ago, we held, had our first Geocto Project Developer Day, and Jim Zemlin gave the keynote. And he was so proud about the fact that there was this uh, municipality in New Mexico that had implemented smart meters on all the homes in the, in the city, right? So they could actually monitor, um, like, every 15 minutes what the power use was at the house so that they could actually update you know, how much capacity they needed on a real-time basis. So that's, that's very cool because you don't waste a lot of power. Um, 
Minor downside. Uh, it turns out that the that that actual power meters are one of the the most uh, um, you know kind of violated uh, things out there. It turns out, in, like in hot weather uh, states in the United States, like Arizona, um, where people often run the air conditioner a lot in, in hot weather. Um, one of the one of the little hacks is to take a very large permanent magnet, stick it on the power meter during the day, so it can your air conditioning can run all day, and the power meter won't actually record anything. Then take the magnet off, so when the person comes to read the meter, oh, I haven't used that much power. Now that's a fairly simple hack. Uh, actually, they started uh, building power meters out of like aluminum and non-ferrous uh, metals as a result. But you know, you kind of imagine that's a fairly Fred, what I would call sort of a Fred Flintstone sort of hack to be able to get at, at that sort of thing. Um, but in fact, uh, the 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 uh, uh, FBI did a little analysis and it has actually shown that uh, at least one. Uh, see if I make a get the actual note here. Um, yeah, the, the smart uh, meter hacks may have cost, a, according to the FBI, they basically said it may have cost a single U.S. U electric utility hundreds of millions of dollars annually because of, you know, essentially hacks on the smart meter. Okay, so we have some interesting issues here. And, and again, we as programmers probably don't think of this sort of thing and, and necessarily want to get all tied up with things like security and embedded devices. But the reality is that, this, that, that um, when these sorts of things start showing up on the front of the Wall Street Journal and, and, and mag in newspapers like that, this is where it's going to really uh, start uh, becoming very, very critical to us to take it seriously. And I don't want to be like Cassandra. You know, uh, Cassandra was the uh, historic fi or the uh, mythological figure who was doomed to know the future but never be believed, I think. And so I don't really want to be Cassandra. I don't want Cass I'm not really a security person. But it's just sort of the, uh, you know, the, the obvious uh, issues that, that, that might result. The real issue, of course, are what they call zero-day bugs. And again, I'm not a security person per se, but as I understand it, the day you ship your software, it will have some bugs in it, guaranteed, right? Um, in fact, there's some people are now talking about forever-day bugs, you know, because th they're never fixed. Um, right, they're things you haven't you haven't thought about, and so um, Linux kernel has uh, a number of them. How many CVEs go out on the Linux kernel, you know, every uh, you know week or month is like uh, a significant number, right? So um, the bugs exist. In fact, Stuxnet depended on five zero-day bugs that were uh, in the in the software that Siemens put out. Now that may seem a bit discouraging because it's like, well, if the, if I don't know what the bugs are and there's no way I can know what they are, how in the world am I supposed to prevent against it? And this is, by the way, one of the critical things, and unfortunately, one of the things I don't have a good solution for to offer you. Um, and that's uh, uh, at least in the Octo project, the, the solutions exist, and you should all implement it. And that's like having some reasonably robust uh, updating mechanism, right? Because because these these uh, these things will come out. You need to have the ability to update all the devices, you know, rapidly and, and securely and uh, robustly, so that, that you don't kill the device when you update it, right? Um, I mean, clearly, if you have a, a situation where you have, um, y you know, uh, a, a customer who's like, uh, well, let's say all the digital signs in Heathrow Airport suddenly become targets of, of an attack and become a botnet that start attacking your 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 uh, company's website, that might be a, not a very good, you know, thing to be known about. So yeah, no matter how you know careful you are, you won't find them. So you really need some way of you know robustly taking care of these things. And you know, remember governments uh, and and kids, frankly. But governments are hard to work. One of the, actually sometimes history just works perfectly. That when I gave this talk last spring, the day before the New York Times had had revealed had actually shown a photo of a building in Shanghai where the People, People's Liberation Army actually had the unit that was known as the Comet Crew. Comet Crew was doing a bunch of social engineering to start cracking into basically sites on the internet. The, the uh, ostensible target were critical infrastructure, you know, power plants and things like that, just have the ability to make sure that, you know, they could have an impact there. And actually, they probably don't even need that because of the CODASYS thing I just told you about. It's relatively easy to break in without even, you know, much in the way of social engineering, just, just a little bit of knowledge. So yeah, governments are, are hard at work. This is actually a, a, a cistern underneath the, the streets of uh, uh, Constantinople or uh, it's uh, uh, Istanbul. So this is, you know, there's dark and secret places down there where people are doing things. And, and by the way, kids are doing this sort of thing too. It's not just you know, governments, uh, Americans, Israeli, Chinese, as I talk about examples, but uh, plenty of other things going on as well. Right. Uh, 
If I haven't depressed you enough, just to be clear, uh, I don't think there are other uh, good an answers either. A lot of people have said, well, gee, let's build, th let's build our embedded devices using Android. And I, you know, I, Android's a great operating system, runs I, on my phone, uh, tablet, I, I love it. Um, I just think in embedded you know, situations, don't think that Android is just going to be the answer because um, actually it's now a, a nice statistical graph that people are, are graphing the number of um, of uh, security uh, issues that pop up in Android, and that you know, it's it's now that you, you can start seeing. It's almost like uh, particles, you know, particle physics, where you can kind of see at a gross level how many devices are actually being. What are they activating? 1.5 million. Chris Simon said in his talk just before, there's 1.5 million activations per day. That's you know, so now it's starting to become the 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 uh, a tremendous target for uh, uh, people to do stuff. No. There are people who are working on some security enhancements to Android for the exact reason that people have kind of gotten themselves into the Android, you know, direction. They go, holy cow, now what do I do? And so at trying to, you know, to do some security enhancements. But I just, I wouldn't necessarily say it's, it's necessarily easier in an Android situation. In fact, there may be more things that you aren't necessarily taking out of Android. How many tablets actually had dialer stacks in them? I don't know. Um, but you know, or you, it's it's you know, you, you just open yourself up to a lot of things that are uh, bad um, things that could happen to you. So yeah, there was a little cheese there. I, I don't know. That's it's just cheese. Um, so <laughs> it's a nice. It was a nice market in Lyon. It was it was lovely. All right. So um, rather than just complain about things and scare you or whatever, what we're trying to do is actually do some things in the Octo project. Um, if you're not familiar with the Octo project, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it here. But I want to, you know, it, it is something that supports Intel, PowerPC, MIPS, and ARM. Um, it really, as Chris, I think, said it really well, trying to collect all the sort of chaos of different sort of build systems and lets you tailor exactly what you want in, in the Linux system. It's supported by a lot of, uh, a lot of vendors, uh, TI, Intel, uh, Wind River, Mentor Graphics, in the... Uh, um, who am I missing? Uh, Chris, uh, um, Huawei, um, uh, Juniper Networks, uh, Ericsson's doing a bunch of stuff with it. Uh, um, who am I missing? I'm missing some people. I don't know. Anyway, so a long list of vendors as well as a, a lot of independent organizations. And uh, we're trying to not only have a great and, and well-supported Linux uh, for embedded, but as well um, a great developer experience. And so we have developer experience tools, plugs in, plug, plugins to Eclipse and that sort of thing. So. Check it out if you'd like. And we're trying to do a few things to, to help out. Um, one of the things is a certain amount of compiler flags. I thought the, it was funny that the Kernel Summit had a, you know, hats that had a corn cob, you know, so because of Kernel. Ugh, anyway, these things don't necessarily translate out of English. I don't know what they were doing, what, what they were thinking about. Um, so um, one of the kind of obvious things you can actually do with uh, GCC is, is add certain tool chain um, uh, flags that allow you to come on in. We'll, we, we won't try and bite. There's actually a, a chair if you want to struggle ahead or just sit in the back. Um, uh, you know, some of the things that, that basically allow you to uh, ensure that certain common attacks are essentially not, uh, uh, in, you know, not available to, to attackers. Now, this is so incredibly simple. It just amazes me that this isn't something that's just a default. Um, but we weren't doing it in the Octo project, and so one of the things that we did was actually implement this in our 1.5 release. So the release that came out, when did it come out? Last week? 18th. The 18th, good. Last week. Uh, last week. Um, so our 1.5 release actually has this, but it's not, um, we're, we're also a little skittish about it too, so we haven't implemented it universally everywhere, but there is one particular, uh, what we call a distro policy. Essentially what Yocto Project does is allow you to create your own distro of, of Linux, right? So we have certain distro policies. So there's one called Pocky LSB that, that we, uh, we're, and, and essentially what this does is it has, we've identified all of the things that, that uh, Intel, or sorry, not Intel, but the Linux bits that, that don't work with these certain of these compiler flags. So we have, we've done the hard work to kind of go through everything that maybe fails because of some of these things. Now, the reason we haven't turned it on uh, universally is we still need to do some measurements as to whether this um, adversely affects uh, build performance or the target performance. So we're still doing a little bit of work, but we have one specific example that you can look at and very easy. By the way, even if you don't use the Octo project, you can look at some of the recipes and some of the things that we've done and actually make use of it. It's like with all the packages that we've gone through in, in, in Linux, we've identified places where these flags don't work, right? So there's actual, some actual work that we've done to try to you know, help with this. Um, 
So these are the compiler flags, the Pocky LSB distro policy helps uh, you figure out. So that's kind of basic, sort of first step. Um, we also have, have introduced something we call the meta security layer. And there's a terrific uh, blog post on the octoproject.org uh, website, which uh, talks about um, a number of things in this layer. So the layer, in, the, another architectural thing in the Octo Project is um, there's a layer infrastructure, which means as uh, just typically, but anything that you'd want to, you know, change in the basic, you know, things that have been, uh, um, you know, set in, in Linux, you can essentially override any of them, shut them off, add new things. And so it's, it's, it's effectively, that's the tailoring mechanism is in these layers. And so essentially you can have a board support package and maybe a user um, interface thing and maybe specific things to your company that you want to have set universally and, you know, things of that sort. So, um, so this meta security layer has a number of tools in it and, and generally speaking what the tools allow you to do is just have um, you know things like static checks okay so there's one called buck security right I got my content expert over here who's gonna stand up and throw things at me if I get too far off off the script um, but buck security at what it does it'll just scan your target image and say okay uh, are, uh, common mistakes right how often have people um, you've read about, oh, well, somebody left a, you know, accidentally left a, an administrator's password on the device. Oops. Or, um, you know, we have these great Eclipse debugging tools, right, for remote debugging. Ha maybe you left, accidentally left the uh, debugging agent, the remote agent on the target. Oops, another, you know, back door, right? So the idea here is to really um, scan through a number of common mistakes, common issues, kind of nice. Particularly if you're creating a product, it's nice to actually put this as part of the process of creating the product, right? Just do the scan. There's some also some dynamic scan tools as well. The issue with security, of course, is that it's very easy for this stuff to get out of date. So we're really trying to, right, really trying to maintain these things and try and, try and keep them fresh. Um, what else can I, am I missing about meta security, Saul? Anything else that... Uh, by the way, this was also uh, a piece, I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, this is something that it was, again, community contributed. There's uh, actually uh, Ann Mulhern, who's a professor at, I um, can't remember where she's a professor of, uh, a computer science professor. Has, uh, she had herself and a bunch of her students work on contributing these pieces to the Octo Project. So um, the, 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 the work has started, but we're really looking for the community to, to help us you know, maintain these things, right? So, uh, you know, I encourage you, I encourage you to get involved. Yeah, you, you mentioned about security. It has some other related static tools as well as some dynamic tools that, that need to be run on the system itself when it's running. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and, yeah. Bug security can be run actually on the root FS um, on the host before it even gets installed on the target. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an important, yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing. So, so as a, what, I, what I refer to as static tools are, you know, of course, you know, what, what you do at the end of having built Linux is you now have a root file system and it's like, okay, you can actually, before you even boot it on a device or boot it on a uh, QEMU, um, you can actually, you know, run some tools against it. Well, again, check some, you know, common errors uh, by just, you know, sort of examining, you know, kind of what's in the root FS. Uh, but you can, other things are, are more easy to check with a running system and so you can, you know, run that against either QEMU, which we provide, or, you know, the actual target hardware you're working on, you're debugging. Um, so that's meta security. That's a door down below the streets of Rents and Champagne. So there was this ancient door down there. It's kind of it's kind of cool, murky. Um, and that's actually in the streets of Champagne as well. And this, uh, you know, the first king of France being uh, being baptized was I thought was kind of kind of a fun picture. Uh, so meta measured is another interesting uh, feature. In fact, this is uh, another two things I want to say about this. One is that it was again com community contributed. It was not contributed by um, you know somebody who gets necessarily uh, a, a, an Intel employee. But the interesting thing about this, this is an Intel feature. So one of the things that Intel hardware uniquely has that's it's very interesting is a feature called TXT, which is uh, trusted execution technology. So what happens is that um, the feature uh, makes use of uh, something called T-boot. Um, so what happens is that uh, you, know, you can have all the virus checkers in the world on your computer or all the, the things to check to make sure you haven't you know, uh, been infected. But what's, what happens if your OS has already been tampered with and, and essentially made all of the, any sort of virus checker uh, um, inoperable, right? Or, or give false results. 
Even worse, if you're running with a virtual memory uh, system, right? Let's say you're running your, your embedded device in a VMM. It's just a nice kind of thing to do. But uh, what if somebody's infected the VMM, right? So, well, that's sort of even harder to detect with something running in user space after the system's booted, right? So what actually the, the, this does with Intel hardware is actually um, a, after you have done your boot of your VMM and your, and your OS, it will do what's called a measured, it's a measured launch. So it takes a measurement of that launch and then writes that measurement in some secure star, uh, storage on the hardware itself, the Intel hardware itself. Then subsequent boots, what happens is that it, those also get measured and the measurement is compared against what's in the secure storage. So in fact, then if you're, uh, you know, somebody's tampered with the OS or the VMM, basically it implements a policy which is like, okay, you tell me what to do next, right? Now, different users of this have done different things. I was talking to a guy at Citrix uh, last night. Citrix uh, was actually, uh, it was a Citrix employee, uh, 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 Philip uh, Trika, who, is he here? Awesome, I'm giving him props, he's not even here. Um, no, this is great because, in fact, Citrix uses this, and if the measurement fails, again, it'll pop up, you know, essentially before it gets into the OS, it'll basically uh, give you a dialog box and says, did you do this on purpose because you just reinstalled Linux, right? Or, you know, or otherwise, maybe you need to go talk to your administrator, and it's, it's a password interface. Guys at VMware are using this as well. Their approach on VMware is to basically say, um, well, all of the storage is encrypted using TXT, and so it basically doesn't give you access to any of the storage. So, again, the cool thing about this is that in, what Intel is actually trying to do to help with this is provide hardware that lets you actually use, a, use the hardware itself to validate that no one has tampered with the OS or the VMM. It's pretty cool. So, it's a great value for, you know, using Intel hardware. Um, so, yeah, the meta measure to, is the, uh, it, you know, is the layer. Check that out. It's, it's another great feature. Um, and I kind of like it because, you know, works with Intel. Um, and it's so, you don't want to miss the fact that, you know, SE Linux, okay, a lot of people groan when they think about SE Linux running on their, you know, their laptop or whatever. In fact, SE Linux is a phenomenal, uh, uh, you, know, you know, secure, you know, Linux, trusted Linux environment that, that I think this, is, this ought to be just, you know, kind of, again, if you're going to create a device that has any kind of network connection, whether or not it's going to be on the public internet, remember those centrifuges were not on the public internet, but they got, you know, infected anyway, right? So it just seems like SE Linux is just, you know, kind of a, a natural thing to do. I'm, I'm delighted that our friends at Wind River, uh, you know, maintain, uh, you know, the meta, uh, meta SE Linux. Uh, I strongly encourage you to, you know, make use of that as well. So, these are all things that are in the, our current release of the Octo project. Um, highly recommend you, you know, get involved with them and check them out. Um, but uh, we missed a couple of things that I was hoping we would have. Uh, I did mention uh, back at, none of you heard me say it, so why am I even bothering you? But just in case, I just think for integrity's sake, I ought to tell you, I thought we were going to do some things that we didn't. Bastille Linux was something I'd heard about at the time as a great static checker. In fact, it turns out it's a little bit like this alley in, uh, the, uh, in a, another uh, city in France where the buildings are so close that they're actually kind of, you know, have to have prop. It, it, it's not really well maintained, okay? Not very modern. Bastille Linux actually turns out it's an HPUX tool that was kind of adapted for Linux. And so um, we didn't do that, but we did buck security instead. So I think it's a bit more, you know, sort of Linux oriented solution. So that's good. Um, but one thing I'm really disappointed that we didn't have is a decent updater. So um, again, it's like I told you, uh, uh, you know, if you have anything, I mean, there's, there's going to be bugs, whether it's in the Linux kernel or whatever other, whatever other software, whether you wrote it or somebody else did, there will be zero day bugs, guaranteed. And so as a result, you look at that and you go, you need some sort of updating mechanism that lets you, you know, uh, send out a patch to that stuff. One of the things we do in the Octo project, by the way, is we try and, you know, patch these relevant CVEs as quickly as possible, and we also provide them in point releases. Um, but again, this is something that uh, you really need to have a, really, a good updater. Now, my idea was uh, six months ago that we would use an updater that had been developed uh, for an operating system project called Fenris, which uh, one of the principal engineers at Intel was doing as a hobby project. And it's got a great updater. There's nothing wrong with the software. The problem is the Octo project is not a distribution. So it doesn't exactly work very well in that environment, uh, you know, because what you really need with a, 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 an updater, it's not just the software, you need to actually be updating something, 
right? I mean, this is the way you make software really you know, robust and work well. Somebody needs to actually be using it and, and you're actually, right? You know, otherwise it's just, it's just somebody's hobby unless people are really pounding on it and using it every day. And I couldn't figure out a way, or actually the smart people, I, I couldn't either, but the smart people on the project couldn't figure out you know, how to get us to implement this in the Octo project in such a way that we really felt good about the code. So um, uh, it's probably much better for a real distribution to use an updater and then at some point, you know, one of these becomes, you know, use Fenris or one of the other ones, if someone could contribute this back to the open source project, it would be phenomenal. But it, it, otherwise, if, if someone's not actually using it in real products, it's more like a hobby and I'm not interested in putting it in the Octo project. So I'm a little disappointed, but that's kind of the reality. Reality sucks sometimes, so that's what it is. So my, I guess my, my encouragement to you as a community is, if someone could contribute something, if you would want to contribute something that's already being used, do you think it's a cool way of uh, keeping embedded devices up to date? Would love to, you know, would love to get your software, you know, into the Octo project and give you all kinds of, uh, you know, T-shirts and <laughs> and props. We'll give you really, we'll give you lots of public props since I think this is incredibly important. Um, so. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, best practices because, you know, it's one thing to um, put a bunch of stuff in Yocto project and, and any, any open source project, whether it's SE Linux or anything like that. But if you don't have an actual, you know, set of best practices to, to think about. And again, I, I understand where you are as, a, as developers. If you're not like developing something, an instrument that goes into military equipment or something like that, you may not really think that much about these issues. But I guess if there's anything that I could do to try and help you think about these a little bit more, and quite frankly, a lot of you are in a situation where maybe you're a contract programmer, right? And whoever's paying you wants something done quickly and get it to market and get it out there. And they're not, you know, necessarily, oh yeah, security, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. So I understand the situation you're in. If there's anything we could do to try and, you know, uh, you know, reveal some of these examples without actually, you know, having somebody show up on the Wall Street Journal. I think it's a really good idea. So I'm hoping that I can get you kind of interested in this and really maybe push your employers to really, you know, implement more of these sort of things. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, this is kind of basic. I think just do, doing the hard work, use the tool chain armoring. We've, we've put the, the Pocky LSB uh, distro policy in place. So what it uses is a, there's a security, security flags.inc file. And basically that file has all the magic in it. So that file, um, you know, basically has essentially what the definition of the flag, the full set of the flags are, and then all of the other, you know, <laughs> exceptions that we found were things busted as a, as a result of it. So strongly encourage you to use that. I mean, it's again, it's built into the, it's built into the fricking tool chain. So just use it. It's just, it's, this is sort of like a no brainer. I wish that we had it universally adopted in all of our, you know, build profiles. Um, what I, I want us to be doing more work. Are you doing, are you taking notes about this? This is be awesome, you know? If I could just, you know, they used to say that um, the, I don't know if I can say this. I shouldn't say the company name because this will get back. But there was some very, very large company, software company that they used to say that the way they did strategic planning is they went to the CEO's keynote and listen, you know, the, the executive staff would sit in the front row of the, you know, the audience at his keynote and that's how they would do their strategic planning. Isn't it? I try not to do that because A, I'm not a CEO, and B, you know, I, I, it's an open source project. Who cares what I think? But actually, I think this is kind of cool. We should do this more. We should actually try to, to you know, really uh, assess what the impact is, and, and, and we're doing that. Okay, it's on the list. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it's, there's a little bit of hard work, sort of like this millstone that's in there that you need to just, um, you know, drive around, you know, grind the grain, but I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it's really good to crack into meta security. By the way, um, if you're not, if you want just some text to read, there's actually a blog post on yoctoproject.org which talks about this. So just go to yoctoproject.org, look at the blogs. There's a blog entry which talks about the, the tools in meta security. Has been updated, by the way, to take Bastille out and put that Buck in. I'm not sure what did. Can you go check that out and just you know maybe hack on it real quick? See, we only do high quality stuff in open source. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, you know, again, there's, there's a suite of tools. We're going to continue to work on it, continue to, to make sure it works in, in subsequent releases of the Octo project. So, um, you know, I, I, that's a, probably another really good, you know, again, you get into the, a, a little bit more work now, again, using the, the tool chain, 
armoring the flags, that's, that's a, sort of a no-brainer. This starts getting a little bit more work, and as, as it pops out, you know, uh, you know, error messages or things to look at, you're gonna have to do a little bit more thinking, a little bit more work to try and figure out, are these things I need to fix? And again, I think it's a really good idea to, to put these things into uh, some sort of process. A lot of what we're trying to do in the Octo Project is not something that is uh, a one-time thing, but it's like, you do, you do your work now for this device, and you can reuse a bunch of it for the next device. Right, you know, as opposed to the old, you know, way of doing things. Oh, you can hack together a Linux, right? And then, gosh, you have to do the whole thing again for the next, you know, whether it's an updated kernel or updated, you know, user space or whatever, right? You got to do it again. And, and a lot of what we're trying to do with the, a lot of the value comes not just from doing one device, but it's doing a product family. It's doing an ongoing, you know, set of things that will, you know, go through n many different kernel versions, user space versions, right? Different families of, so the whole idea here is to really leverage this. If you're only going to do it for one device, maybe it's not all that, you know, interesting, but it's actually to create, you know, real value of, for your long-term product, you know, direction, right? Um, right? Would you say that's true? Oh, okay, you're just grunting, all right. Um, use it so, um, I had a point there. Anyway, so try and make use of a lot of those things. I think, I think that's a, I, I think those are, are, are good. Um, and I think, uh, oh, you know, again, implementing some sort of update mechanism. I, it says practice, but I think it's more than just a, a mechanism. It really is a practice. So it's like you could, again, if you're a consultant working for an employer and you create, you have this great mechanism, but then, you know, it's not actually part of a, a practice then it's like, well, you just sort of wasted time, right? And by a practice, what I mean is you need to make sure that, or whoever is implementing the device, needs to make sure that a, a patch or an update doesn't, you know, brick the device, right? Um, you know, particularly if you do a BIOS update as part of this thing, or a, you know, firmware bootloader update, you've got to make sure that it doesn't, you know, that the thing will still work. So, so you know, people who have maybe um, uh, 10,000 devices deployed worldwide and, and all of their warehouses or all their HVAC machines uh, might get a little nervous. In fact, I was going to, I was going to pull out a, an example. You know, it's always fun to go to an embedded conference and have hardware. Um, I have hardware. Oh, here it is. So this is uh, um, a little board that uh, we just launched. Uh, Intel just launched. It's called the Galileo, and it's uh, um, it was launched in a Maker Fair as a, a uh, you know for Arduino support. So it's so it's 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 cool from that standpoint, right? But the other thing is since it runs Linux um, and it's got a got a little you know Intel chip on it. Um, basically, the idea was. Uh, a lot of great applications this will go into. Our CEO um, talks about the fact that it's, um, there's somebody who has uh, HVAC uh, equipment all over the world in both very hot and very cool uh, uh, parts of the world, and he's, uh, in, he's basically installing this thing in all of them so that he can do remote you know, monitoring, and both for energy use as well as maintenance uh, things and things like that. So, but if you're going to implement stuff like this, this, this poor person who puts all these HVAC things out there, uh, a Linux connect with Linux devices, you got to ask yourself the question, is there a good update mechanism that that, you know, customer of ours is putting in place? And so that's something that, um, and again, I think it's uh, one of the things that's good about, you know, uh, if, you have a, if you have a hardware vendor that has security features in the hardware, I also think that's a good idea. Again, but that's a, that's a practice you need to put in place. This, uh, this actually brings up another uh, point that, uh, seeing Chris back there, I, it reminds me. Uh, um, I, I, you know, there are, I, I'm not a security person. I gotta tell you, I get scared about security issues, um, but I'm not a security uh, expert. Um, in fact, it's probably, it may be worth it to bring an actual expert into the equation to think about it. It was a great talk from somebody at Mentor Graphics. I mentioned Chris back there. He's from Mentor Graphics. And they're great security experts at Mentor, Wind River, and NIA uh, are, you know, partners, and as well as consultants uh, who are using the Octo Project, who have developed an amazing set of tools far beyond what we have in meta, you know, meta security, right? So that they can really em employ these things to help you out. Um, I, I, you know, the thing that's always daunting about me is I see all of these things that, that security experts use and it just, it, it makes me depressed because it's like, I'll never be an expert in all these things. Well, I think part of the, the, the good thing is there are experts who, you know, can, you know, employ more of the tools and help you out. So um, I think the ecosystem is, is ready to help out. Right, Chris? I mean, yeah, right? So uh, not just hardware manufacturers like Intel, 
but some of the people working in the ecosystem with the Octo project can really help you know get this stuff going. A very cool little board. All right, what else? So what's coming next? Um, there are a few things. Um, so one of the things, <laughs> it seems kind of obvious, but just Maintaining the stuff that we put into the Octo project is pretty important, right? We talked about um, the fact that we have a release, you know, last week. Um, we come up with a new release every six months with the Octo project, and this is actually the, the 1.5 release, I think, is our fifth or sixth, I think it's actually our sixth? 0 0.9, yeah. That's just basic math. I ought to be able to add it up. Yeah, it's our, our sixth release that we've done every six months, a little bit insane, let me tell you. But having come within, you know, a week to a few days of, of where we targeted each of those releases, and they all come with, an, with the latest uh, um, basically supported released kernel, um, GCC toolchain, uh, and as many of the user level, you know, Linux, you know, ecosystem uh, components as we can. That, and again, the, the challenge of building an operating system is just getting the thing to work. When there's literally like a thousand projects all over the internet, right, that are, you, you know, that you can choose from to build a working OS. It's a little bit challenging. We've done a lot of that hard work for you, so you don't have to compete on the, the, the latest and greatest, you know, grep command, right? You can actually have, start with all that done and then build actual value on it. Um, but that's incumbent on us as an open source project to do the somewhat prosaic work of actually keeping this stuff up to date and actually making sure we maintain it. And we all, again, we'll we love help. If you find that, that we've missed something and you can, you know, submit a patch, uh, we would love to, you know, include you with that. Um, that. You know, I think one of the things that's all, I talk, oh, now I remember when I was talking about the, the value of the Octo project is actually it has you know, it's, it's not just for the one thing that you're going to be doing, but the whole, you know, sequence of things that you do over time, right? The next product and the next one and the next one, so you don't have to redo things. But one of the things I think is, is incredibly powerful is, is really establishing kind of workflow. It's not just, can I get Linux and can I put some apps on it, but what is the workflow? Um, <laughs> and this is something that we've actually worked a lot about with the developer experience. We've added some things, not only our Eclipse tools, we've added Hob, which is a graphical uh, developer experience that lets you do things without necessarily, you know, resorting to command line. We have our first versions of our web-based experience. Uh, you could talk, you, you could also go to Jessica Jong's talk uh, today or tomorrow, I can't remember, it's either today or tomorrow, talking about how you can use uh, actually Windows to build your, you know, Linux system. What? Or you can use your Mac OS, okay, that's better, to, to, to build a Linux system, right? So those are just kind of, you use the web, use Windows, Linux, Mac, right, to use any of those to, to build a Linux system, right? So the developer experience is something that we're working very hard on. But there's yet another thing that I think is incredibly important. I've, I've had a, I've been harping with people about this for the last, you know, three years we've had the project out of how do you make sure the thing is done, right? What is the part of the experience which you can basically say, okay, I want you to just sort of do all of the stuff that you would normally do to release a product. Now, we already have some great stuff built in on licensing, for example, right? Because one of the things you have to do with a, right, a product that has GPL-based code in it is you need to provide the source code for the GPL stuff, right? And you need to provide, a, a, you know, it's good to have a license manifest. So we exactly do that in the Octo project. We have the ability to create you know, an archive, a source archive, so you can meet the GPL requirements. Oh, joy, you know, it's automated, right? And create a license manifest so people can know all the licenses that are in the stuff that you just created. Awesome, but all of this should be automated so that not only should it be the, you know, the creating of the source archive and the checking all of these security things that are part of it that it's like, okay, this is like the last step that I do when I'm just about to burn the devices and produce, you know, hundreds or millions of them, right? Uh, that sort of that finalization step. So those are some of the workflow things I really want to see integrated both into uh, Toaster, which is our new web-based, uh, you know, um, baking interface. We have BitBake, we have the Hob, which is what you cook on in England, I guess, and then we're gonna, you know, give the Toaster, so. Um, anyway, but really to put it into the, the developer experience so it makes it, you know, makes it easier. So that's something we want to try and do. That's Hyde Park, I think some point. Um, and then, you know, what are the missing pieces? So again, we're really looking for, you know, this is incomplete. Actually, this is an ancient uh, Roman city in Turkey. I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's unpronounceable to me, but it was like a few missing pieces to an actual complete city. Um, so we're a little looking, uh, you know, for, for really more help from you as a community to really help get us, 
you know, better, you know, tools. Uh, what are the pieces that are missing? So I'll, uh, we're very open to this and interested in your help. Um, so, uh-oh, yes, hit the right key. Okay, what's left? Um, again, I think uh, as a, you know, uh, uh, really what I would encourage you to do is, I've said this about three or four times, I'll say it again, get involved with this as a project. Get involved with the Octo Project. We're, it, it's a fun bunch. Um, there are a few characters like every other open source project is, but, but actually um, I think we've done some amazing things over the last three years. And so I'd really encourage you to, you know, continue to, to work with us. Um, we have a number of uh, interesting talks today and tomorrow. I'll show a list of what they are. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, let me just do that now, right? Uh, thanks. Okay, yes, Jessica is giving her talk on modernize embedded Linux software development tools to achieve development anywhere. This is the development anywhere bit that I think is, is key there. Paul this afternoon is going to be talking about uh, the, one of the big things we did in 1.5 was we have integrated automated QA. So um, d creating a QA framework is not rocket science. There's so many of them, just, you know, just pick one, right? But we actually now have the ability with, when you do a build, basically there's a suite of QA tests that run against it. Okay, so that it's actually checking the functionality of the thing. And we're doing some additional extensions on that. So we'll automatically run against a bunch of, you know, real hardware as well. So we'll have a, you know, basically lab of, of, of real boards that this will run against also. So it's very easy for you to integrate your own hardware into this as you do the build. It's like I said, finishing the thing, right? So you not only, what do you have to do? You have to do a bunch of QA. We were doing a bunch of manual QA before and it's like, holy crap, this is horrible. So we've actually, you know, hopefully simplified a bunch of the effort that we're doing. Um, to make sure things work. Um, Jeff, uh, tomorrow, is gonna, tomorrow morning is going to have a boff on the Octo Project. Come with your questions, comments, nasty remarks. Mark uh, is, from the, uh, is from Wind River. He's going to be talking about SPDX and the Octo Project. This is um, the, where the community is really trying to get on top of this whole licensing thing. Again, we've done a bunch of work on you know, the source license compliance, and so there's some great tools we're doing with SPDX. And then Ross... Poor guy, last thing Friday afternoon. Uh, but he's gonna be, he it will be, a, uh, Ross is a very, you know, senior architect on the project. He's gonna give, I know it's gonna be, I haven't seen it. He always gives a very uh, informative and entertaining talk uh, with lots of good pictures and lots of good stories. So, um, there's also the chalk talks. Oh yeah, and during uh, lunch, I think out there, there's some chalk talks that are gonna happen as well around the Intel booth, I think, right? Okay. That's all my content. Are there any questions? from the boss. Yes? I think, yeah, I think, uh, I think the question is, is there any robustification? I would say that's probably more in like meta SE Linux. I think, I think meta security is more the analysis tools. Yeah. Yes, please. Just um, your, your comments on device updates, thinking about firmware images, Versus package updates. Um, what does Yocto do now with the different output package formats? Right. Do you, do you have key signing? Ah, uh, okay. Um, so we support. You know, there's always religion about which package format you support. Do you support Deb? Do you support RPM? We're, uh, one of the things I love about the project is we support them both, as well as IPK, which is sort of a very lightweight, uh, embedded-oriented package mechanism. I don't think we have signed packages, do we? We have RPM3 support, but I don't think we actually have RPM5. signing in. RPM5, sorry, I always get those confused. RPM5 support. We're not signing them at this point. Uh, I'm not sure what it would take to make good, qu good question, though. I know that's important. Please. Uh, do you have support for any kind of, um, of separation between the operating system and the operating system? Because the operating system is So this is a, actually, so the question is, do we run serv different services as different users, UIDs, basically? That's something that I, I believe is Android's primary security mechanism. Every application you install is a different UID. Um, that's actually not a policy we've implemented in, in, uh, in Yocto Project. You certainly could. There'd be nothing, there's nothing inherent that says you must. So it, it's something that's some, it's available. Some recipes for some services do implement UIDs as Dave said, it's not something that's across the board implemented that way. It, it depends on 
uh, the service itself. Last question. Yes, please. Um, have you implemented any of the sort of security kernel patches, geosecurity? Or yeah. In fact, there are some of those that um, we haven't implemented because they didn't seem like they were as uh, applicable to um, embedded devices. So I, I think that's probably an area we could do better on. The kernel maintainer, I don't actually see him here. He's probably going to the x86 talk at the same time. So um, I, no, I, don't, I, I know of several that, that I've, are candidates so far. I've looked at each. I've looked at them and I've said, I'm going to see how they apply to embedded necessarily. So we probably will look at those as they come up uh, for sure. Thank you very much. Make sure you go down to the booth and get your Yocto box. Thank you very much. <laughs>